Dan is ranked number five among the glo world's global thinkers. Uh, now, one has to temper this. Uh, I, I, do you want to guess who's number one? Al Gore. <laughs> Metrically, it works. But number two is, is, is Jurgen Habermas. Uh, uh, right behind Dan is Elon Musk, uh, Lawrence Lessig, Jared Diamond, uh, Oliver Sacks, Peter Higgs, uh, Daniel Kahneman. Anyway, a fascinating list, but I think to be ranked not only in the top 10, but number five on that list is impressive. It means a lot of people are, are trying to find out and are interested in what uh, Dan, Dan is doing. Uh, tonight, he's going to talk to us about, is free will an illusion? What can cognitive science tell us? So please join me in welcoming Dan Dennett. Thank you, Jerry. It's great to be back. I love Santa Fe and the Santa Fe Institute. I always, every day I learn something here that I don't think I could learn anywhere else. And, uh, so good to see such a nice audience. Can we have the lights up a little bit higher? I, I really like to see faces. This isn't, this isn't theater. Good, thank you very much. Uh, well, I know, it is sort of theater, but, but I, I depend on seeing faces in case anybody goes to sleep. Or, uh, well, I, I have to say I, I have some bad news. Um, if you were to look in your wallet right now, if you have any $20 bills in your wallet, I have to tell you, they're all counterfeit. Every last one of them. And the ones in the fives and the tens, and if you've got a $100 bill in there, it's counterfeit too. In fact, not just the bills, but all money is counterfeit. There hasn't been any real money since 1973, when we went off the gold standard. It's all just an illusion. Money doesn't really exist. It's just an illusion. I hope you're not too heartbroken about that, and, and, and be careful how you use that information, too. <laughs> also, baseballs hit over the green monster in Fenway Park in Boston. They're not real home runs. There aren't any real home runs. They're all illusions. Yeah, and free will's an illusion, too. Hint. I'm going to be arguing that those who argue that free will is an illusion are arguing in the same spirit of these other two arguments. You can see there's a sort of point to what they're saying, but it doesn't have the implications that you might think. In other words, don't burn your bills. <laughs> don't throw away your... your bank accounts. Uh, free will, I'm going to argue, is, it's as real as money, which is pretty real. It's not an illusion, but we have to see what the arguments are. Um, a little experiment now first. Um, uh, um, please uh, wave your right hand at me. Thank you very much. Gee, a lot of you did it too. Now, uh, all of you do this. How many of you can do this? Yeah, a few, all right. Now, you see, those are paradigmatic voluntary acts. Why did you do them? Well, let's pause a second. I asked you. There wasn't any overriding reason not to. What the heck? You're cooperative, so you went along with me. If I'd asked you to stand up and undress, you probably would not have gone along with that. But if you had, that would have been a voluntary act, too. <laughs> the, the idea is, this is how you, you can prove to yourself that you are capable of voluntary acts. See, see if you are actually able to control yourself when somebody asks you to do something or when you ask yourself to do something. And some people, you get, it's worth noting, they can't do them. There are people, afflicted people, who are in locked-in syndrome, or they have some other disability where the voluntary acts are really impossible for them. Lucky you, you're not in that category. You're not in that category at all. Now, one might say that that shows that voluntary acts are not an illusion, uh, 
If somebody said voluntary acts are an illusion, you'd say, well, no, no, we just demonstrated to ourselves that we can perform voluntary acts. Do another one, you know, do, do something. See, you can do it. None of you did right then. <laughs> and, that's a, and that's a voluntary act too. <laughs> Refraining from doing what somebody says is a paradigm case of a voluntary act. Um, well, are voluntary acts an illusion? Some people seem to think so. Uh, I'm going to use a deep thinker now to introduce the themes of my talk. I've done this so often, some of you may have seen this. It's my favorite uh, exposition of free will. It's by none other than Dilbert. <laughs> and here's Dilbert. Dogbert says, do you think the chemistry of the brain controls what people do? Of course. Then how can we blame people for their actions? Because people have free will to do as they choose. Are you saying that free will is not part of the brain? Of course it is. But it's the part of the brain that's out there just being kind of free. Okay, so you're saying the free will part of the brain is exempt from the natural laws of physics? Obviously, otherwise we couldn't blame people for anything they do. <laughs> do you think the free will part of the brain is attached or does it just float nearby? <laughs> Shut up. Now that really does capture uh, not just the everyday notion of free will, but the sort of state of play among the scientists and the philosophers. It's, a, it's an embarrassing issue because it, the themes, the main themes are all there and, and very nicely said. So now we might ask again, are, is, does, is free will an illusion or not? What I'm going to do tonight is a, uh, with you is a, a bit of an experiment. What I'm going to do is uh, abandon one of the central terms of philosophy, uh, which has become almost useless, and that is free will. It's the tug of war over how to define this term has become the whole issue. So I'm just going to set it aside. I'm not changing the topic. I'm just changing the verbiage. And I'll probably slip and call it free will at some point. But let's just forget about how to define free will for a while. And why should we do that? Well, because the traditional concept of free will has two essential features. One of them is that free will is undetermined, that is, free will versus determinism. And the other one is that free will is required for moral responsibility. If you don't have free will, you're not morally responsible. Now, these two themes do not sit well together. And the question is, are they both true, in which case we've got a problem, or might we define free will and understand free will in a way which one was, was true but negligible, trivial, and the other one uh, true and important. Well, since people simply will not abandon the first point, especially scientists I've discovered, I'm just going to give them the term, okay, you can have free will, define it your way. Free will and determinism are incompatible. Now, I'm going to drop the term and I'm going to turn my attention to the question of whether Moral responsibility is possible. And what does science have to tell us about moral responsibility? We just leave free will out of it. Now, does cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, any science have anything to tell us about moral responsibility? That's now the topic. And a lot of people think it does. And I think they're right. But not for the reasons that they've been saying. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. Now, still on the topic of my, of my experiment, I, I want to point out that in my career I've faced this many times. There's sort of two options. I can say, free will doesn't exist. Or I can say, free will exists, it just isn't what you think it is. Now my policy in the past on various topics has been the second one, and this has led to some very frustrating campaigns. I say, consciousness is real, it just isn't what you think it is. 
and people here, consciousness isn't real. I say beliefs are real, they're real patterns, they just aren't what you think they are. And people here, Dennett says that belief talk is a useful fiction. I don't know what to do about this. But I get inspiration from a book by a friend of mine, Lee Siegel, a wonderful uh, uh, philosopher of religion and magician who's written a book I highly recommend, Net of Magic, about Indian street magic and its history. And there's a passage in the, in the coda of that book, which I've become my, my uh, talisman in a way. He says, I'm writing a book on magic, I explain, and I'm asked, real magic? <laughs> By real magic, people mean miracles, thaumaturgical acts, supernatural powers. No, I answer, conjuring tricks, not real magic. Real magic, in other words, refers to the magic that's not real. <laughs> While the magic that's real, that can actually be done, is not real magic. <laughs> now, what I've discovered in my own career is that for many people, consciousness, let's say, if your view of consciousness is that it's not real magic, then you're not talking about consciousness. They insist that consciousness is magic. For instance, here's one of my critics. The problem here is with the claim that consciousness is identical to physical brain states. The more Dennett et al. try to explain to me what they mean by this, the more convinced I become that what they really mean is that consciousness doesn't exist. Well, given what Wright, Robert Wright, thinks consciousness is, I have to agree. That kind of consciousness doesn't exist. But consciousness exists, it just isn't what you think it is. How about free will is magic? Well, my old friend and off-time opponent, Jerry Fodor, puts it very succinctly in a review of my last book on free will. Uh, one wants to be what tradition has it that Eve was when she bit the apple. Perfectly free to do otherwise. So perfectly free, in fact, that even God couldn't tell which way she'd jump. In other words, one wants a miracle. Another philosopher, Galen Strawson, reviewing the same book, says this. He doesn't establish the kind of absolute free will and moral responsibility that most people believe, most people want to believe in and do believe in. That can't be done and he knows it. He's right. I don't establish the kind of absolute free will and moral responsibility that most people want to believe in and do believe in. That can't be done, and I know it. <laughs> the question is, why do people want absolute free will? Why? I'm going to try to answer that. Wouldn't practical free will be good enough? <laughs> so now it's time to look at what the scientists say. Here's one, Wolf Singer, eminent uh, German neuroscientist. No one is responsible for their actions since all is predetermined by the brain. Here's another British eminent neuroscientist, Chris Frith. It's po if it's possible to predict people's actions on the basis of neural activity that precedes their conscious decisions, if so, then free will is an illusion. My good friend Sam Harris published a book a few years ago called Free Will, and in it, he argues that free will is an illusion. He's, he's a sort of scientist. He's got a PhD in neuroscience. But here's some praise from scientists for this book. Well, he's not, he's very good. He's just not an, uh, doing academic neuroscience research now. He's a writer with a PhD in neuroscience. <laughs> Paul Bloom is the, Yale professor who's the editor-in-chief of Behavioral and Brain Sciences, very distinguished cognitive scientist. If you believe in free will or know someone who does, then here's the perfect antidote. My good friend Jerry Coyne, eminent Ch University of Chicago evolutionary biologist and blogger, says, free will is an illusion so convincing that people simply refuse to believe that we don't have it. 
In Free Will, Sam Harris combines neuroscience and psychology to lay this illusion to rest at last. Okay. <laughs> so that's quite, a, quite an endorsement of the idea that free will is an illusion. And it's not just cognitive scientists that do it. Even a few physicists add their voices. Here's, uh, you know, and they're not unknown physicists. Here's Stephen Hawking. I won't bother reading the whole thing, just at the end, it seems that we are no more than biological machines and that free will is just an illusion. And then just one more. A being endowed with higher insight and more perfect intelligence, watching man and his doings, would smile about man's illusion that he was acting according to his own free will. So who said that? Well, I think you know. So this is a fairly formidable team of people saying that free will is an illusion. And if you may remember, I'm going to say, basically, they're making an argument which is close kin to dollars are an illusion, home runs are illusions. So we'll see. By the way, not all scientists take this view. One I think is worthy of mention is Mike Gazaniga. He's a neuroscientist, indeed very eminent, and in his book, Who's in Charge?, he has a much more subtle and nuanced view. He, he knows better. Now, faced with this wall of overconfident eliminativism, as we philosophers insist on calling it, I hate to think of the mother of philosophy PhD, her friends ask her, what's your child's dissertation on? Eliminativism? Oh, yeah, he's a philosopher, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, as I said before, I'm going to temporarily abandon the term free will and concentrate on the rest of what these scientists claim, and that is that this lack of free will makes a moral difference. And you may have noticed that they, they do say that. For instance, here's Chris Frith again. Uh, if it is possible to predict people's actions on the basis of natural activity that precedes neural activity, that precedes their conscious decisions, if that's so, then free will is an illusion. Now, there have been quite a few experiments that have drawn the attention of people. Um, in the past, I used to talk about the work of Benjamin Libet, but I'm not going to talk about that today. There are a lot of problems with that. I'm going to talk about a more recent experiment which has had much attention in the scientific literature by soon at all in Nature Neuroscience. And uh, I'm just going to briefly explain how, how this works. This is a diagram from there. Uh, uh, so you got your head in an fMRI scanner, and what you're seeing at half second, 500 millisecond intervals, are just single letters of the alphabet appearing a little faster, see, half a second, sort of like that. So you get one every half a second. And then after a bit of them, you get one more screen, and it has letters on it which, are, uh, which match the letters. And so what your, your job in the end is to uh, uh, push a button for which, uh, which letter was on the screen when you did something. What? When you decided to either push the left button or the right button. This is what they say. At some point, when they felt the urge to do so, this is an unmotivated free act, they were to freely decide between one of two buttons operated by the left and right index fingers and press it immediately. In parallel, they should remember the letter presented when their motor decision was consciously made. So here we are back to this again. So if at the moment you decided to push the left button, the letter that you saw was D, then you would, after, you know, you pressed the, the left button somewhere in this interval, and then when this screen came on, you pressed that button. That's it. That's the experiment. Everybody understand it so far? Okay. Now, what's the result? Remember, a little, let's be clear. You say the letter that you were conscious of at the time that you consciously decided. Okay? And you're not supposed to do something like, I'm going to wait till I see a letter G and then I'm going to push the button. No, no, no. 
you're supposed to let the Spirit move you or something. You're supposed to, this is supposed to be an act gratuit, a, a sudden, motiveless left or right, and you're simply supposed to notice what letter was visible to you when you made that decision. Okay, and here's what they found out. I won't bother uh, going through the slide in detail. You'll be grateful to know. Um, uh, this is the key slide because it shows activity in the brain that they have teased out with their, with their um, algorithms, which shows that um, as much as actually 10 seconds before the subject is aware of having decided to push left or right, they've got evidence of whether it's going to be left or right. So it's a mind reading device of sorts. Mm, yeah. Now, does that show that people don't have free will? It seems to meet Chris Frith's condition. This is using evidence drawn from neural patterns seconds, 10 seconds before the person is conscious of the decision. It looks as if the decision is uh, an epiphenomenon or it's not playing any role. The brain has already decided long before you think it has. That's the suggestion. Now, this is, uh, you notice I put predict here in scare quotes, and that's because it isn't real-time prediction, it's, it's scientific prediction. That is to say, it takes them much more than 10 minutes of number crunching with their data mining algorithms to get this evidence out. So, if you wanted to make it into a real prediction, what you'd have to do is seal in an envelope the actual left-right choices that they made and the facts about when they made them by their, their subjective facts, and then let the computers crank, and then they would come out with a bunch of predictions about what you'd read when you opened the envelope. And they'd be right, pretty much. They can do this prediction, not, not perfectly, but much, much better than chance. And there are technical problems with this experimental setup. There have been many replications, though. It's not, the basic result is not in doubt. One way or another, you can get this sort of effect. There have been a lot of people that have done it. And I'm, not, I'm just going to assume for the rest of the talk that we should take this at face value. So, <clears throat> It's important that these aren't predictions in real time. Uh, not yet. But if you can do it with slow number crunching, then maybe in the future you can do it with fast number crunching. So that's, that's the sort of experimental evidence that we're talking about. Now, what does this show? I'm going to turn to Dilbert again, because he has some words of wisdom on this subject. Free will is an illusion. Humans are nothing but moist robots. <laughs> Just relax and let it happen. I love this term, moist robot, <laughs> because I think it's, it's right. I think cognitive science does show that we're moist robots. That's really quite uncontroversial. According to science, we're we're mammals. We have non-miraculous brains, just like other mammals and other animals. Our brains have no mysterious, extra special, magical powers. We're moist robots, made of robots, made of robots. By the time you get down to the insides of the cells, you find all those little motor proteins trudging around doing their work. They're robots. They're nanorobots. They really are. So that's what we are, and Dilbert draws the conclusion that since we're moist robots, we don't have free will. And notice that he adds the important conclusion. Just relax and let it happen. In other words, you're not responsible. A moist robot couldn't be responsible. Another very wise Observer of the scene, Tom Wolfe, writing about this, oh, quite a few years ago, actually, by now, in an essay called, Sorry, But Your Soul Just Died, 
As this to say, as usual, it's a little hyperventilated. The conclusion people out beyond the laboratory walls are drawing is the fix is in. We're all hardwired that and don't blame me, I'm wired wrong. <laughs> well, I think Wolf is right. That is the lesson that is leaking out inside the laboratory walls, or in many cases, being trumpeted by the laboratory directors. We don't have free will. Now, we're wired wrong, says Wolf. Well, wired wrong? What would it be to be wired right? Or is there such a thing? Could we be wired right for responsibility? Or what would it take, in other words, for a moist robot to have moral responsibility? This is the question, and the answer isn't obvious. Now, if you think that you, if you're a moist robot, you can't have moral responsibility because only somebody with an immortal, immaterial, magical, transcendental soul could have free will, then that settles it for you. But that's not a scientific a thesis at all. And if the scientists are falling for that, then they are being very uh, unimaginative indeed. So, now the question is, does cognitive science show that these requirements uh, for moral responsibility cannot be met? So I want to look now at moral responsibility as eligibility in the moral agents club. We members make the rules, which are not entirely arbitrary. Rules often require bright lines and penalties for violations. Um, you probably belong to some organizations that have membership rules of one sort or another. But if you want a, a simple example that everybody finds, I think, fairly uncontroversial, let's talk about the age at which you may apply for a driver's license. What is it in, in New Mexico? Is it 16? 15, but then you get your license at 16 or 15? Okay. It varies from state to state, and that's interesting because it means this is a politically drawn bright line. It's not something, it's not discovered by science. It's not arbitrary. I think we can all agree that 14 is, 13 is too young, and 20 is older than it has to be. So we're in the ballpark, and we might, if we want to move the line, that's a political option that we can consider, and we could use scientific evidence gathered from studies about, about myelination in the brain and maturity and all sorts of other things if we wanted to. But we're pretty happy with the line we have. Most people are. And it's important to realize it is a bright line, and it's conventional but not completely arbitrary. There's good reasons why it is approximately where it is. I think that's a, that's a toy issue. That's a toy solution to a problem, and the whole issue of moral responsibility uh, has that same logic behind it. It's like the driving age. So now, back to illusions. Let me see. How many of you think that dollars are real? I do. They're real enough for me. Boy, if you don't have them, they sure seem real. And home runs, and attorneys, and doctors, and bishops. These are all real social constructions. Now, some people may be reaching for their gun at this point. They think, oh, no, one of these postmodern social construction of reality people. No, not the social construction of reality. There are people out there, ideologues, who argue that you know, mountains aren't real, and atoms and electrons aren't real. These are all just social constructions. DNA is just a social construction. Uh, that's not the view I'm making, I'm asserting. I'm talking about the construction of social reality, which is different. Baseballs are as real as they can be. Home runs are real too, but they're social constructions. This is one thing, by the way, that John Searle is right about. I don't often agree with John, so it's nice 
to be able to agree with him about this. We're talking about the construction of social reality, not the social construction of reality. Most reality doesn't need any help from social construction, but some of it does. There wouldn't be doctors without social construction. And what I'm going to claim is that free will is a real social construction, and none the worse for that. And I'm going to do it in terms of the Moral, for, moral Agents Club. Now, this is not a new perspective. It owes a lot, of course, to Thomas Hobbes and the Leviathan and other contractarian theories. You may remember from reading the Leviathan in college that, uh, that uh, Hobbes said that, that life in the state of nature was nasty, brutish, and short, and then people came together, this is sort of a just-so story, and they had a social contract, and that created society. And it was just the state of nature before. And when it did, we created good and evil when we formed the social contract. Very important to realize that Hobbes was saying something quite radical. He wasn't saying we created the concepts of good and evil, or the words good and evil. He was saying we created good and evil themselves. Before the social contract, there was nothing. Morality just didn't exist. There's predation in the world of nature, lions and tigers and, and, and all sorts of horrible parasites doing all sorts of terrible things to other beings. There's no, a, there's no morality there. It's all amoral. Morality just does not exist in the state of nature. It came into existence with the creation of a social contract. Now, this is, a, I think, a very attractive view. It can easily be parodied and made to look foolish. At any rate, I am going down a path that has been well-trodden by others before. And we created moral responsibility at the same time we created morality. Well, is it as real? It's as real as dimes, dollars, and doctors. Real enough to make a really important difference. Well, now, how do we look at this, then? We want to look at what an engineer might call the specs for a morally competent agent. I put it in this engineering term because I don't want to rule out robots. If you wanted to make a robot that was a moral agent, what would it have to have in the way of competences? The same competences as you and I have, but having blood, being born of woman, doesn't necessarily appear on the list. We'll see. Here are some, if those do, then we can add them to this, these other set of specs. First of all, you've got to be well-informed. Not just well-informed about lots of things, but well-informed about the things that matter morally. You have to know about what it is that hurts people and what it is that people care about, and you have to know about basic understanding of causation, so you know what you better be careful about, and so forth and so on. And, of course, you're supposed to know about the law. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. It's just a very vivid, intense attitude on that. Um, you've got to have roughly well-ordered desires if you're obsessive or just completely deranged in the way uh, you con uh, are unable to control yourself, then you're, you're, you're disabled. You don't have the competence you need. You have to be, as Kant says, moved by reasons. That is, if somebody offers you reasons, if somebody tries to reason with you, you can deal with that in a rational way. You can respond to that. In fact, the word responsible really comes from the idea that a responsible agent can respond in a give and take, a discussion of the reasons for or against some course of action. Those are familiar. I want to add a few more, which are less often talked about. One is that you're not being controlled by another agent, that you're punishable. I'll come back to these. And the granddaddy of them all that you could have done otherwise. Now, I take it that these six requirements are the heart of what it is to be a moral agent. And so now the question is, does cognitive science, or for that matter, any other science, tell us whether or not we, as human beings, normal adults, whether we can meet these conditions. Are we eligible for the Moral Agents Club? And I'm going to talk about this one first, not being controlled by another agent. 
And I'm going to give you a little thought experiment to, so you get the idea of what's at issue here. So here's four cases of causation where I am caused to do something by the actions of another agent. Are you ready? First case, I go to the doctor and my doctor tells me that bran blobs would be good for my heart. I believe him, I go out and I buy some bran blobs. That's case one. Case two, I'm in the supermarket and I see a box of Kellogg's bran blobs and I read in the yellow highlighted fine print about the health benefits of eating blob bran blobs, and I decide, okay, I buy a box of bran blobs. Here's case three. I see a box of bran blobs with a gorgeous picture of Cameron Diaz on it, and I buy it. <laughs> case four. I see a box of bran blobs which has a secret microchip transponder that tweaks my nucleus accumbens in my brain, and I buy the box. Four cases. In every case, I am caused to buy a box of bran blobs by the intervention of some human agent. The first case, that's the way we want things to go. To, if only we could all be caused by a wise and knowledgeable advisor who has our interests to heart. If only the advice of such an advisor could cause us to choose our, our actions, we'd be in great shape. In the second case, it's pretty much the same, it's just that some, at some slight uh, uh, indirectness, I'm counting on the fact that Kellogg's has a reputation to defend. It's not, it's not uh, uh, Sammy the Scam Artist's bran blobs that are for sale here. This is Kellogg's. A lot is at stake. They've got credibility on the line. If they say they've got a bunch of health facts, if they say that this is good, it's probably not too far off the mark. I, I, I'm not being foolish. I'm being reasonable, perhaps, to believe them. In the case of the Cameron Diaz, here it matters what kind of a, how, how sheltered a person I am. If I've never noticed or heard about how sex sells merchandise, then maybe I'm being manipulated. But you know, I, I've been around. I know about these things. If I buy the box because of the beautiful picture of Cameron Diaz on it, it's because I want to reward the Kellogg's company for their good taste in women. <laughs> Case four is the really problematic one. Because here I'm being manipulated, and I don't even know it. It's not appealing to my reason. It's short-circuiting my responsibility machinery and just going straight to the wanter. That's manipulation. The difference is secrecy. I am being manipulated. I'm being caused by an agent whose attempt to cause me to do this is unknown to me, and that is very important. Being caused by the intervention of another agent to do X does not mean being controlled by another agent. One of the rules of the Moral Agent Club is protect yourself from secret manipulators. And notice, we all appreciate this, if we learned that there were these little transponders being put into products, we would all be in the market for something that would block the actions of this why? Because we want to go on being free, responsible agents. We don't want to be manipulated. So now when we go back to that quote from Fodor about what, what one wants, one wants to be so free uh, that even God couldn't tell, why does one want that? One wants to be unpredictable. That's true, and it's wise. You do want to be unpredictable. Why? Why? to avoid manipulation by other agents. An insight that comes to us from game theory, and if you read the opening chapter, as I did recently reread it, of uh, uh, the great Fun Neumann and Morgan Stern book on this, lovely discussion of Robinson Crusoe and how it ch everything changes when there's another agent on the island. Uh, I have a student, Liam Clegg, who's written a good paper on this, 
and some of what I'm saying is sort of borrowed from him, so I have to certainly give him a reference. He hasn't published it yet, but it's available on his website at Caltech. The maxim from game theory is you've got to hide state from your opponents. If you don't, you're going to be just turned into a money pump. If you don't have a poker face, if you can't keep your decision-making secret, you're in trouble. This is one of the requirements of a morally responsible agent, that you can keep your thinking to yourself. But why absolutely secret? Here, I think, we have a prime case of a familiar philosophical step or a misstep where the philosophy was well, very important to be F. We all agree on that. So it must be best to be absolutely F. We love absolutism. I'm saying, no, no, you don't need that. Practical free will is good enough. Why not? Now let's go back to Soon and his mind-reading experiment. I do think there is a moral to that story that has relevance here. And it's this. Don't play rock, paper, and scissors for money with Soon if your head is in an fMRI machine. <laughs> Actually, you might just as well do it until he's got the speed up so we can make real-time predictions. But I think that's the only moral from Soon's experiment that has any serious bite. Now, Clegg, by the way, observes that Soon's result is actually an adaptation for practical free will. Why? The fact that, you, that your brain is churning away and it's deciding that, that you're going to push the left button this time, or you're going to go rock rather than paper or scissors, it's really good if that can be kept from you as long as possible so that you don't have a tell that can be read by your opponent. It preserves one's poker face till the last moment. When you think about it, the best way to play rock, paper, and scissors is to play randomly when you can't lose. If you can really have a... But we're all bad at random series. At rand we're bad at just generating random numbers. So if you really got in a position where you had to play rock, paper, and scissors with somebody, and the important thing was not to lose big time, what you should do is go to a table of random numbers, something like that, and copy down 50, put them on a piece of paper, and use them to, to determine what you do next. Just don't let anybody see your list, because then you're sunk. So that's the implication of not being controlled by another innate. Now how about is punishable? This lies at the heart of a lot of the thinking of the motivation of the scientists. Um, what I want to do is not look at the criminal law. I want to look at the everyday distinction of those who are responsible adults and those who are not. Setting aside the criminal law and just considering the law of contracts. Um, I gave to my students a couple of years ago, we were do, doing a seminar on, on uh, autonomous robots. And I gave them as a thought experiment assignment, what would it be take to make a robot that could sign a contract? Not for somebody else, not as a surrogate for the robot's owner, but on their own hook. What would a robot have to be so that you would sign a contract, that you would, you would make a binding promise with that robot? And what they eventually came to realize was you got to have skin in the game. Robots generally don't, but if you made a robot that had some serious needs that could be thwarted by the penalties that could be extracted were it to break a promise, then you could start making promises with robots. You've got to have the same sort of vulnerability that the rest of us do. How many of you own a house or have a mortgage? Okay. You qualified to sign a contract? then you're a member of the Moral Agents Club. Lucky you. Congratulations. But now let's consider signing a contract. You sign a contract and you renege. Then what happens? Well, probably you pay a penalty because there's probably a penalty clause written right into the contract. What happens if you don't pay the penalty? 
What if you defy the court? Well, you get a subpoena under penalty. And if you defy that, what do you do? You go to jail. For rehabilitation? No, for punishment. This is not rocket science. This is, this is the justification for the institution of punishment. It's a consequentialist sketch. Here's a consequentialist sketch of why punishment is okay. I have to raise this because some of the scientists, they think that what they want to do is abolish punishment. The very idea of punishment is always wrong. And I think, no, no, no. I was, in fact, notorious for saying in an earlier book, I don't want to live in a world without punishment. And they said, oh, you evil retributive man. You. And I said, well, I don't want to live in a world without promises. And you can't really have promises unless you have punishment. So here's the rationale. You're an intentional system, that is, you have an agent with beliefs and desires, and some desires are stronger than others. And law is an artifact that takes advantage of this by yoking your strongest desires, the desire to live, to avoid pain, to keep your wealth, to be free, and it turns those into constraints. And those constraints are the conditions of civilization. These are what make, for most of us, acting against these laws unthinkable, all but unthinkable, because we're motivated, so motivated. Now, back to the specs for morally competent agent. We've got to look at the killer at the end there, could have done otherwise, which on its face seems to suggest a denial of determinism. So does could have done otherwise mean what tradition claims, namely the denial of determinism? No, it doesn't. What it means is what it has to mean to play the role that it plays in our social practice of holding people responsible. So we'll look at that and see how that comes out. There, it is a matter of assessing self-control competence. So let's see, I want to use an example. I'm going to choose a, an example made famous by J, the late philosopher J.L. Austin. I've written about this several times. Austin, in a famous footnote, gives this example. He talks about a putt. This is Austin's putt. And he says, Consider the case where I miss a very short putt and kick myself because I could have hold it. It's not that I should have hold it if I'd tried. I did try and missed. It's not that I should have hold it if conditions had been different. That might, of course, be so. But I'm talking about conditions as they precisely were and asserting that I could have hold it. There is the rub. You know, he's, a, he's an Oxfordian, an Englishman. That's why he uses should here, where, the, where we would use would. Okay. The phrase in this that matters is this one. I'm talking about conditions as they precisely were. Now he goes on. Nor does I can hold it this time mean that I shall hold it this time if I try or if anything else, for I may try and miss, and yet would not be convinced that I could not have done it. Indeed, he goes on to say, Further experiments may confirm my belief that I could have done at that time, although I did not. Okay, I want to talk about those further experiments. Remember, I'll go back a couple of slides. He said, I'm talking about conditions as they precisely were, and then he's saying that further experiments could shed light on this, could confirm his belief. So here's some further experiments. You tell me what you think of these experiments. In the first experiment, he says, I could have made it. And his pl partner says, I don't think so. He says, oh, really? Watch this. I'll show you. I'll prove it. He takes out a box of matches, lights 10 in a row, throws them on the... He says, so what's that all about? Indeed. Okay, so he does some different experiments. He lines up 10 different putts about the same distance, and he gets 9 out of 10 of them. And his opponent says, wait a minute. You said conditions as they precisely were. They weren't the same. It was a little bit later. The sun was a little lower in the sky. The humidity was different. The grass was a little bit drier. The balls were, it wasn't the same ball. You were a little bit more tired. You have a completely different mindset. 
No, the conditions were never the same as they were precisely on that occasion. Do these experiments confirm that you could have made it? I say, yeah, they do, but only if we deny Strawson's claim that it, what mattered was precision, uh, conditions precisely as they were. That was simply irrelevant. If holding conditions precisely as they were was a requirement for testing could have done otherwise, the putting experiments would be no more relevant than the match striking experiments. But clearly they are. The putting experiments are relevant because they measure competence not by creating exactly the same condition, but by actually by varying the conditions ever so slightly. That's the only way you can ever prove competence. And this requirement for measuring competence is the escape hatch from determinism. As follows. Driving along saying, this car can go 70 miles per hour. With conditions precisely as they are right now, Oh, no, no, I have to press down on the accelerator a little harder. It's going 60 right now. In fact, it can go 50 right now, but I have to take my foot off the accelerator a little bit. You don't ever prove competence in any regard, animate, inanimate, by looking at conditions, rewinding the tape of life and doing, running exactly the same conditions through. That shows you nothing about the the competence, especially the robustness of the competence of the agent in question. This car, I say, could have done otherwise. It could have gone 70, it could have gone 50. Another car maybe would not be able to go 70. It's an old clunker. No, 70 is its top. No matter how hard I press on the accelerator, it's never going to go 70. The difference in competence is what you measure by slightly adjusting the conditions. In fact, we're never interested in whether X can do Y in precisely the same circumstances. The very clause that Austin insisted on is in fact a mistake. That's not what you use when you want to know whether somebody could have done otherwise. Or when a car could have done otherwise. Or when anything could have done otherwise. It's simply irrelevant to the issue which is important, morally important, and that is moral competence. Like all artifacts, law is a compromise and a cost-benefit calculation. It's a practical solution to a problem. We came up with this wonderful idea, the Moral Agent Club. Great benefits, but you have to live by the rules. The benefits are security, reliability, trust, promising, the security of our, and, our, and the ability the political ability to do what we want. Membership. Now, some folks really are wired wrong. They have retardation or brain damage or dementia. And cognitive neuroscience can help us sort out who those are who are wired wrong and who those are who are wired right. The ones who are wired wrong are morally incompetent through no fault of their own. The rest of us are competent, lucky us. There are some very deep problem cases. Psycho, psychopathy is one of the most interesting and important and difficult of those. Adrian Rain wrote a very good book on this last, about a year ago, called The Anatomy of Violence. There's a review of it on my website. It appeared in Prospect Magazine. No time to go into it here. Is it fair to exclude some as ineligible? Well, you know, we, we exclude children. We say they're not morally responsible yet. They're going to grow into moral responsibility. We don't hold them fully morally responsible until they grow up a bit. We understand them to grow into moral responsibility. And there's no bright line. Some children are morally responsible at 12 and others are not really eligible at 18. When you become responsible, you become punishable. And you can't jettison that from the requirement. For instance, society puts parents on notice. If you spoil your children in either direction, either by being too lenient or being too, too hard on them, they will suffer as adults because they will be held responsible. This in itself is a strong motivation to parents to give their children a moral education, to give them a moral upbringing. 
because their parents care about the fact that society was going to hold their children responsible unless they're seriously disabled. So pay up or quit the club. Is it fair to those who are declared eligible but found to have violated the rules? Here, I want to use another toy problem to make, it, make clear what I think the answer is. Consider punishment in sports. Is it fair to give a red card in soccer? Is it fair to put a hockey player in the penalty box? I submit that those who think that science has shown that we have no free will, among their targets should be abolishing all penalties from all sports. Because nobody ever deserves a penalty. These are forms of punishment. I don't think that would fly very well. Again, if you don't like the rules, don't play the game. The fact that Jan is morally responsible and Fran is not is a socially constituted fact. It's like the fact that a 350-foot fly ball can be a home run and a 349-foot uh, home run, uh, a fly ball, is an out. Yes, the line is arbitrary, but we draw it. We've agreed to play the game, and that's the way, that's the way we're going we're to have to implement our understanding. The home run rule is fair because it's been negotiated by the likely participants. If you don't like it, don't play baseball. And similarly, you can live like a hermit if you really don't want to be part of society, but you forgo the benefits. Our punishment system, let me hasten to say, I think our current punishment system in this country is obscene, it's ineffective, it's indefensible. So I agree with the scientists that there's something rotten there. But I say fix it, don't jettison it. Again, I don't want to live in a world without punishment. We want to tune the punishment system. The goal is to preserve its credibility while minimizing suffering. Ideally, you'd like people to think, well, if I get caught, I'll be punished with a probability close to one. That's, of course, never the case. We can, there's a trade-offs here that we can look at. Some agents, it turns out, are simply undeterrable. They're grossly undeterrable. Children and idiots and people with a gun at their back and others. And so we excuse them. But the others we hold responsible and we don't look too closely. It's like the driving age. It doesn't matter how mature you are as a 15-year-old or a 14-year-old, you don't get to take the driving test. Now, there's an arms race that I think we can understand. It's, it's uh, others try to exploit the loopholes in the law, and so we revise the laws. As we learn more excusing conditions, we revise the laws again. This is where cognitive neuroscience and cognitive science can help us guide to better legislation about who's a responsible agent and who not. What about toxic upbringing? Some, some people bring this up and think it's very important. And of course it is. But it's not obvious what we should do about it. Um, what about what I've called the threat of creeping exculpation? The more we learn about how people's brains work, the more we'll see that nobody's ever really responsible. We will just excuse and excuse and excuse and excuse the more we learn. Is that a real problem? I don't think so, not for a scientific reason or for a metaphysical reason, but for a political reason. There's a powerful force on the other side. The rights and privileges of citizenship. This way we politically enforce a boundary between those who are responsible and those who are not. You know, I'm a philosopher. We're notoriously absent-minded. Suppose I get caught speeding and the officer pulls me over, and I say to him, look, I'm a philosopher. <laughs> My head was in the clouds. I, 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 I just can't really concentrate on these mundane questions about speed limits. He says, okay, give me your license. We'll take you off the road. You're clearly not qualified. <laughs> no, no, no. I say, I'll pay the fine. Why? Because I want the freedom to get in the car and drive on the highway. 
The last thing I want to do is to be declared a non-member of the Moral Agents Club because of a deficit in my reasoning ability. I'm quite prepared. There's a, there's a payoff here. It's a practical, not a metaphysical boundary. Um, these are all artifactual distinctions that we have agreed to play by. It's a good deal for almost everybody, and we're constantly trying to improve it. Is that really so? Yeah, I'm, I'll show you how. How many of you know about the marshmallow effect? Way back in the 70s, the psychologist Walter Michel did some important experiments with marshmallows. He had little kids aged, I think, three to five, roughly that. And he put them in a room, and he put down a marshmallow on the table, and then he'd walk out. And before he walked out, he'd say, if you can go 15 minutes without eating that marshmallow, I'll give you a second marshmallow. Well, imagine what those kids did. By the way, delicious video exists on the YouTube. You can, you can watch it from his, from his old films. And the kids try all sorts of things. They get up and they walk around and they hold their hands and they, they mumble. And, and about a third of them, uh, uh, about a third of them get the second marshmallow. A third took the first marshmallow right away. <laughs> and the rest, this is sort of the painful group, they hang on for a while, but, but they succumb before the time limit's up. Uh, it's really quite heartrending to watch this. Okay, but now, here's the bad news. That was way back in the 70s. These people, these young kiddos, have been, have been tr tracked through their lives now for 40 years. And the bad news is that those who took the marshmallow very significantly, unwanted pregnancies, trouble with the law, delinquency, drug addiction, you name it, the whole panoply of bad effects. Stunning. That's the bad news. The good news is that there are non-invasive training methods which will make the effect go away. Eyeglasses for the mind, in effect. As cognitive science learns more and more, as it be, becomes able to predict effects like this, it can also devise ways of helping people get across that threshold so that they can be members of the Moral Agent Club. That is a very valuable service that cognitive science can play. So some scientists want to jettison the concept of moral responsibility. I think they're not thinking clearly. They don't want us to abandon promising. They just want to abandon punishment. And I don't think that makes sense. They want us to abandon retributive punishment. They don't distinguish that from defensible punishment. Some of you may remember a book by Carl Menninger back in 1968 called The Crime of Punishment. He advocated medicalizing all all response to antisocial, asocial, antisocial behavior. Grim idea, actually. Uh, not an inspiring book. Just think about what they did to people in the USSR. They said, oh, we're, we're not punishing you, we're treating you. Treatment, how many of you would rather be punished than treated? <laughs> Me. You know. So the Moral Agents Club, I'm happy to be a member of the Moral Agents Club. I'm lucky to be a member, but I do take steps to preserve my membership in good standing. I think we need to reform its practices significantly. And meanwhile, it's the best deal in town. Thank you for your attention. Now, uh, questions, challenges, objections? Yes, sir.
Okay, well, I addressed a few already, social constructs. And I think it's important to realize that social constructs really do change the environment. They are, they're real. Uh, uh, societies are not the state of nature. And in our own minds, in our own psychology, in our personal individual psychology, there are a lot of constructs. I've just uh, headed a working group up at, up at SFI on cultural evolution, where we've been looking at the way cultures evolve to create, boy, do they create structures that help us to think and help us to be moral agents and, and help us to invent things. And these are, these are constructs. And the self itself is a construct. Um, none the worse for that. Um, if it weren't for those constructs, the pieces of the little metal discs in your pocket would, wouldn't be worth anything. Uh, if it weren't for the constructs, you wouldn't be able to think about all sorts of things that you think about. It's good stuff, constructs. Yes, in the, up there, yes. Thank you. I, I have a copy of it. Yeah. Oh. I tell you what, I'm going to put it in my stack of books that people have written about free will recently, and I'll get to it maybe someday. <laughs> It's quite a big stack. Yes, what, what about it? I mean, what about the culture of, yes, uh, what about the culture of poverty? I, I've presented, my talk has been, as it were, um, even quite culturally specific, very Western, very, very Western industrialized. And what about, about other cultures? Um, very good question, a very important question. What about the culture of poverty? Um, what I know about this at, in, from, in an amateur way from reading the work of anthropologists and others, uh, they have much the same set of rules. Some of them have less, uh, uh, less emphasis on, on personal responsibility. Uh, sometimes even you get uh, remarkable societies where, um, you know, if my brother kills somebody, I'm just as responsible as he is. Um, I'm not a complete cultural relativist. I think there are better and worse constructions. I am quite prepared to uh, consider adopting significant revisions to our cultural constructions of responsibility. I think we would be a lot better off if we, and this is an idea of the philosopher Alan Gibbard, if we turned the volume down on guilt and uh, uh, made a few other adjustments in the way we consider individuals. I wouldn't uh, abandon the idea of moral responsibility or for that matter free will, but I would certainly moderate them. I think there is a lot of truth to the objection coming from some of these scientists and philosophers that our traditional ideas of free will, uh, the sort of mystical ideas of free will, license a sort of cruel vindictiveness 
that is out of place and that we would do well to get rid of it. Yes, over here. All right, she wants to know what, basically, what the practical or political end, uh, or where, do we, where would I go from here? Uh, would I want to change the laws? Would I, wh- how would I want to spread this around the globe? And moreover, you're suggesting that our, our choices are, in fact, more limited uh, by our environments than, than we perhaps think. Well, actually, there's a, on this last point, there's a lot of very interesting research which shows how valuable it is to have limited choices. There is, there is the uh, uh, affliction, the, the uh, being overpowered by too many choices, which makes us reason rather badly. And this has been a, an interesting topic of research by psychologists and others uh, recently, I- including look, looking at how animals respond to uh, an overabundance of, of choices. Uh, I, don't, I don't think, in other words, I think you're right that our environments uh, structure and limit our choices to some degree. I think that's true, an important observation, but I don't think it is a problem. I think it, it is something, it is a fact to address in our thinking on these topics, but it, it's nothing that rules out maintaining an idea of free and responsible choice. Um, I don't think we have to change a lot of laws. We should certainly change our whole system of punishment. It is, as I say, obscene. But I don't mean, think that means that we should, we should limit punishment or, or, or abandon the concept of moral responsibility. I think that is a, a social, political project, which I do hope goes forward. And I just want, I want the neuroscientists to put their shoulder to the wheel in a way that's helpful and not in a way which is, I think, very unimaginative. That's true. There's many anomalies of that sort. Uh, but that's part of the wonderfulness of life. Let me come over and get somebody. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, I certainly have. And I think uh, religion has nothing to do with it. Um, I think at its best, religion often makes some people more moral than they otherwise would be. But I don't think that any of the precepts of morality, I don't think any of our understanding of the difference between good and bad is due to any religious, any particular religious doctrine. The old, age-old question is, uh, uh, that philosophers spilled a lot of ink on is, you know, uh, does God command something because it's good or is it good because God commands it? Um, I think the latter is a preposterous idea. (laughs) You tell me I shouldn't do X because God says that's prohibited. My answer to that is, who's God? I mean, and why do you think that God has any authority over this? It's a rude answer, but then in a way it's a rude assertion in the first place. I've had fun, actually, uh, when the topic is religion, because you may know I've written quite a bit about religion recently, and sometimes I've been interviewed by right-wing Christian radio programs and uh, who take all of that for granted. And I got in the habit of saying, 
Uh, Lucille says you're wrong. I say, what? I said, Lucille says you're wrong. They say, who's Lucille? I say, it's a friend of mine. She's always right. <laughs> now, that's rude. But so is what they say. And it has no place in a reasonable discussion. Did, could everybody hear that? Okay, well, let me, I'll say, how does science define the difference between will and understanding or the boundary between them, and how do they get put together? Uh, is that, will that do? Okay. Um, that's a good question, and part of the answer is, uh, is to acknowledge a little bit of embarrassment. I think cognitive science, until quite recently, was very obsessed with looking at the inbound path, looking at perception and memory and judgment and discrimination, and very little attention was played to volition, control, action planning, and things like that. This is changing, I'm happy to say. Uh, there are there's some very clever and serious uh, uh, groups around the world that are working a lot on voluntary action and, and will, if you want to call it, that um, will and understanding are uh, traditional terms that some, to some people seem to mean separate faculties of the mind. That's, that's sort of obsolete. We now understand that there's a, a real uh, interaction, lots of feedback and interaction effects between between understanding or comprehension, discrimination, and the control of action. And this is coming out in interesting ways. And people are also now finally deciding that emotion is not just a, a source of noise <laughs> in these models, but is actually playing a very crucial role. And so models of decision making, which at the neural at the neuroscientific level are looking at mo neuromodulator balances and sort of the tugs of war that go on between different systems of neuromodulators and the temporal dynamics of that. And that's all very important work, I think. Uh, well, no, but so here's something that's close. Adrian Owen and is one of the pioneers in this, neuroscientist. There's a condition called locked-in syndrome, which is thankfully rare, but it's really dramatic in that a person can be completely conscious, wide awake, and unable to move any voluntary muscle. And they're, they seem to be comatose. They aren't. Uh, this is, as you can, if you think about it, a, bit, a terrifying condition to be in. But now, tests are devised so we can identify it. And of course, it, it can also be used to show that people are not in that state when you might wish they were. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, to remind you of a not so far in the past obscenity, the Terry Schiavo case, where people who knew nothing about the science were imposing their judgment in really horrendous and cruel ways. We can distinguish these. And we shouldn't let legislators or family members think that they know better than what the science shows. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, they're, 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 they're games and training exercises and they're just sort of mild compensatory uh, exposures of the children to situations where they can sort of strengthen their, their, their self-control. There's a literature on it. I'm not an expert on it, but if you go looking for it, you'll find it quite readily on the web. But you, good question. One more then. Well, oh, yes, back there. Oh. Well, no, thank you for asking that question because you notice that um, uh, I've given you the answer. They're not punishable. So they're not moral agents. They're not responsible. The people that are running them are. So we, we've got to find those that have skin in the game and hold them responsible. That's a too short an answer, but it... But it will have to do because the, it's a it's a longer and more complicated issue, but but I think the resources in my view are there to say why we shouldn't just consider them responsible. I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you. <laughs>